And that takes us to the final installment of our two-week-long series that we call Obama and the World. Tonight, our focus is China, and we're joined by Adam Siegel. He's a senior fellow in China studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, and by John Delury, the associate director of the Center for U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society right here in New York. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you for being with us. Yes. So 100 years from now, is this going to be viewed as the period that uh, China started to assume global supremacy? Should the United States be worried? Well, China's got a lot of room to grow, um, and they have a huge population. When you look at the, at least in economic terms, um, they're expected to surpass Japan this year as the number two size economy in the world. They've surpassed Germany as top exporting country. Uh, now, of course, on the flip side, you have to divide all that by 1.3 billion people. So the per capita numbers, I mean, it's still a very poor country. Um, and a lot of what we're hearing now uh, sometimes uh, gets exaggerated when it comes to there's a lot of anxiety being projected on China. Do, do you believe, Adam, that it's exaggerated? I do. I think there's two issues. I think one is China has fundamental weaknesses that we forget about, that it is still overwhelmingly a poor country. It has massive environmental issues, a social uh, inequality. But I think the other issue is, is that um, if China were to be accepting responsibilities, in fact, in the international system, that would be a good thing for the United States. If, if we saw China taking more responsibility, for example, for rebuilding Afghanistan or uh, putting more pressure on Iran and North Korea. But what we've seen so far is that the Chinese actually seem to be lagging, that given how big their international economy is, given how important they are as an economic player, Politically, they're not playing the same role, and I think that actually is the biggest problem for the United States right now. Some of the lagging may be strategic. Um, it could be intentional on China's part, and, and Deng Xiaoping kind of set out a foreign policy um, motto of sort of keeping your head down and, and, and waiting for the right time. Um, and I think that probably still does guide a lot of, of China's foreign policy. If you look at something like the idea of G2, which is being talked about in Davos, I guess, right now. Um, this idea of the United States and China forming the, these two, you know, new bipolar uh, order. There's a lot of resistance from China because it's really not in accord with with their approach. Mm. Um, but but I think they're playing a long-term game where they, again, driven by economics, are building up. Um, the, the political capital, and they're not eager to accept the burdens of responsibility right now. Let, let's get into some of the points of friction, the sore points in the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, one source of disagreement is the U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. Why are the Chinese so upset about this, um, and uh, why is the United States going to go ahead with it? Well, the Chinese consider Taiwan to be a part of, of, of China. And um, we, the United States, in fact, agreed that we would slowly uh, wind down our arms sales to Taiwan, given the uh, situation in the region, that as it became more peaceful, we would slowly wind down. Uh, we haven't done that because we don't really actually believe that the situation has become more peaceful. And the Chinese continue to threaten Taiwan militarily, primarily by about a thousand short-range missiles that are that are targeted at Taiwan. Is this something, do you think, that could derail, potentially derail U.S.-China relations in the future? The Taiwan issue, I mean, from the Chinese perspective, it's always the most sensitive and explosive. But right now, I mean, there's a lot of positive trends in terms of cross-straits relations, and Beijing likes the current government a lot in Taiwan. So it's actually a relatively tranquil um, period uh, that we're in. So it's, it's not at the top of the list of hot spots. Mm. And uh, collectively, Taiwan is sort of referred to as one of the three Ts, trade, obviously, and, Taiwan, uh, and Tibet being the other two issues. And the president is expected to have a meeting with the Dalai Lama at some point. Uh, previously, that meeting had been delayed. What's on the cards in terms of Tibet, the United States, and China? I wouldn't expect for any major breakthroughs. I think the president is going to try to recapture some ground that he lost when, def when he deferred that meeting and basically say that, yes, the United States would like a resolution of the, of the Tibet situation. We would like the Chinese to uh, give the Tibetans more autonomy, more cultural and religious space. But we're not going to fundamentally change our view, which is that Tibet is part of China. Right. Why, did you th why do you think that the president changed his mind? Um, well, I, I think that, uh, you know, he, he wanted to make a gesture 
uh, and, and defer the visit with the Dalai Lama. And he didn't get much back from the Chinese for it, and I think the administration was probably pretty upset about that. Um, so it's, an, it's not surprising that he's going ahead with a, with a meeting now. Um, there are evidently meetings going on uh, as we speak in Beijing between representatives of the Dalai Lama um, and uh, the Chinese government. So there may be some marginal progress there. I would agree we're not talking about big breakthroughs. The other big thing to remember with Tibet is ultimately it really is a domestic issue. Um, it, you know, there may be lobbies that care about it in the United States, but it is very much a domestic issue. And, and within China, there's a huge segment of the Han, ethnically Han majority uh, population who are fully supportive of some of the hardline policies uh, in Tibet. So when Chinese policymakers are thinking about Tibet, their first thought is not Washington. Mm. Let's talk about trade. What are the areas of disagreement there? Well, the major the major concern is the valuation of the renminbi, that the China uh, still has pegged its renminbi. It, it, it hasn't moved in, in quite a while. We had some uh, valuation of about 30 percent in the, in the years running up. But the United States, given its economic situation, given this rising unemployment rate, given the president, as he mentioned last night, is focused on jobs, there's going to be an increasing pressure on uh, China to do something about renminbi, which, which makes Chinese exports cheaper to the United States. So that, I think, is going to be the primary issue. If you talk to China these economists, um, what they're concerned about is not so much the, the renminbi, but they're concerned about the fact that they have a very unstructured economy that's dependent on exports and investment and doesn't have enough uh, consumption, and they're not dealing with that issue. All right, John DeLury, Adam Siegel, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Thanks. you.